Whether it was Carlos Sainz breaking the Red Bull streak in Singapore, Max Verstappen's epic final sector in Monaco, or Fernando Alonso's last lap heroics in Brazil, there were plenty of incredible moments throughout the season this year. Now, with the scale of operations in modern Formula 1, the work never truly stops, but it's around this time in the calendar where we look back and take stock of the year's action before the rumour mill kicks into gear in 2024 and the liveries are released before testing in February. Today, we'll look past the top stories and unpack some of the more dramatic and meaningful midfield moments that may not stand out in the highlight reels, as Verstappen's truly insane records dominated the year's coverage. I've titled this section the Alpine Peaks because unlike their mountainous namesake, the Alpine team are yet to reach the lofty heights and truly capitalise on their potential in Formula 1. Oscar Piastri and Fernando Alonso's driving talent had slipped right through their contractual fingers and they're the lowest performing factor in the sport, where factory means a team that produces their own engine rather than buying another manufacturer's power unit package. The sizeable investment package for Alpine that was announced back in June seemed like a bit of an exercise in dip buying. I mean, you can imagine how much more expensive a 24% stake in Red Bull would have been compared to the $218 million paid for the same equity share in the French brand. Anyway, this video is meant to be about underrated F1 moments and not just a treatise on Alpine's underperformance in the sport, and those underrated moments for the pink and blue cars came in the form of two Grand Prix podium trophies. And of course, while massively superseded overall by the points and podium tallies of McLaren and Aston Martin, both Alpine drivers took to Grand Prix podiums at least once this year. And Aston Martin can't say that. First Ocon in Monaco, and then Pierre Gasly actually made two trips, first in the sprint before the Belgian Grand Prix, and then at the next race at Zambor in the full Grand Prix. There were brief moments that punctuated a solid, if far from exceptional, first season for Gasly and Alpine, and the podiums of both drivers were earned in races that required control in tricky conditions, great strategy execution, and a fundamentally quick pace in every area. What Gasly was able to do in Zandvoort was, if only for one further round, carry over that momentum from Belgium and upgrade that P3 trophy from a sprint to one from a full Grand Prix. Now that weekend, of course, it was Gasly's former team, the Alpha Tauris, that were dominating the headlines, but that's a whole other story. In Zandvoort, Gasly was able to get his first Alpine podium from his 13th start from 12th on the grid. And it was a drive that started with softs on a wet track, then inters on a track that was too wet to race on, and it concluded with a final sprint to the flag after a red flag restart. Gasly battled with Max after the first stops, he followed his strategy until the end of the race and he crossed the line in P4, but he inherited a podium place after Sergio Perez's pit lane speeding penalty was enforced. It was Gasly's first podium since Baku the year prior with his prior team and it was an important statement for his side of the garage as a new entrant to that team. Of course, a lot was made pre-season about the battle in this Alpine team and when you look at how close they finished in the driver's standings, we were absolutely right to predict a good fight. Now, Esteban Ocon's story starts, as many Monaco success stories do, on a Saturday rather than a Sunday. Back on the 27th of May, the 20 F1 drivers returned to the Principality of Monaco, driving their machines in anger for the first time, as the commentators often say, in a fight separated by only an extremely tight timing margin at a track with equally tight Armco barriers. For a moment, with just over three minutes to go at the end of Q3, Esteban must have seen the headlines, his own name in lights as he crossed the line to take provisional pole with a 111.553. Now track conditions improved and as the proverbial wicks were turned up and purple sectors flooded the timesheets, it was tense moments in Monaco as the drivers knew any mistake from now would probably end the session and ruin all the nine other drivers' laps. I mean, no one hates that more than the other drivers when someone shunts it into the wall, whether on purpose or by accident. But Leclerc, the home hero, he was first to go top in those final Q3 run signs couldn't match him. Fernando Alonso headed into Rascaps with double purple sectors and a chance to step towards his first ever victory in over a decade. He does so. By 22,000s, his garage erupts with noise. There's only one contender left across the line. Who else could it be? But Max Verstappen, two green sectors didn't look like enough to put Verstappen in pole. Verstappen pulled another little bit of last moment magic from his bag of tricks and he snuck through into P1, tapping the wall on his way through and of course took the eventual win at the Grand Prix. Now for Ocon, Despite initially crossing the line in P4, he inherited that P3 that had initially gone to Leclerc, after Leclerc was given a 5 second penalty for impeding Norris. Ocon, in some ways similar to Gasly's podium then, inherited it through someone else's penalty. Nevertheless though, SD Bestie, as he referred to himself as in his post-race team radio, he inherited that grid position and through the chaos and the weather drama and the following day's Grand Prix, he put together what many had hoped at the time would be the first chapter of an Aston Martin-esque turnaround for the Endstone outfit. They got a visit from Jeremy Clarkson and his farm after the race and plenty of plaudits from the press, but 
That was a branding opportunity that for the Alpine team was super, super valuable. If they could capitalize on it, it would be a great sign for the future. But if they failed to, maybe it was more of a fluke than the future. The Alpine podiums may be more of a peak than patterns. I mean, they'll need a huge winter development package to start fast next year. Their lineup is pretty solid. It avoids the risks associated with pay drivers and rookies, but the new equity caps will put them with plenty of pressure to perform. Wrexham look to be on their second consecutive promotion campaign after getting out of the fifth national tier of English football last year. They currently sit in the League 2 promotion spots this year, which even if you don't know or care about the English football pyramid, is a really impressive sign of success, and it comes from the same owners that have just bought this stake in the Alpine team. Alpine's new investors will be expected expected to deliver similarly impressive results, just as Williams' new owners demanded from first Jos Capito and now James Fowles. And even with the fact that they're kind of in this no man's land in the championship where there are big points gaps on either side, Alpine's podiums this year are still quite underrated moments. I think without them, it would have been a particularly weak season. And we know that the shareholders are still not happy. They're going through plenty of staff changes. I mean, we even saw that right in the Belgian GP weekend. But I think both those podiums, and particularly one in Monaco, is really, really special and valuable for a team that are trying to find their identity in modern Formula One. So the next moment on my list then is the Mercedes sharing the podium back in Spain. 2023, as we've covered many times before on the channel, was a big year for Mercedes to bounce back and in simple terms, going from firmly third in the big three last year to P2 this year by an admittedly smaller margin is a step in the right direction for the Silver Arrows. With the chicane removed, the Spanish GP was a promising prospect for fans and drivers who would welcome the addition of another fast corner and the improved flow of the circuit. The change circuit set the stage for a newly upgraded Mercedes car back in June. Russell raced from 12th all the way up to 3rd and Lewis from 4th up to 2nd. That weekend, Mercedes had started struggling, at first with a car balance and a performance that throughout the opening two practice sessions was not comfortable. It was only when a setup breakthrough was discovered thanks to Mick Schumacher overnight, the team's late night simulator work back at the factory, when Mercedes started to head in the right direction. And after the race, Lewis debriefed the media by saying it was the best the car had been for the last year and a half. So that's kudos to the amazing group of people we have back at the factory continuing to work hard and push the car forward. It felt the best yesterday and today that it's felt for the past 14 or 15 months. That's super encouraging, I think, not only for me, but everyone in this team. This will be a big boost for everybody's morale and we'll take that energy on to developing the car. To finish P2 in the championship in a year defined by Red Bull's dominance was contextually acceptable, if far from ideal. Now, the single moment of a double podium in Spain was the moment that I wanted to mention as underrated here, as it put another result in the perpetual cycle of Mercedes being nearly back on form and then way out of form and then nearly back on form and this seemingly never-ending technical struggle with their new car. But there were other moments too that I think are underrated in the Mercedes story. And in Japan, before their dramatic turn one tangle in Qatar, Russell and Hamilton came close to colliding on a number of occasions in the Japanese Grand Prix. The first flashpoint came at Spoon Curve as Hamilton ran Russell off track. And then towards the end of the race, Mercedes did this team radio thing to try and get Hamilton ahead of Russell with the pair becoming increasingly under threat from Carlos Sainz behind. And what came out of that were plenty of narratives about this internal fracture in the Mercedes team, about the team radio messages where it didn't feel like their goals were perfectly aligned and you're probably never going to truly get that from teammates but the way it was being presented to the media when Mercedes were also already struggling on a technical basis to have this kind of sporting internal communication struggle too was another layer that they didn't really need and probably pushed the team back a little bit in their fight back to the front of Formula One. And the fourth thing, the penultimate thing that I wanted to bring up in this video was Alex Albon at the Canadian Grand Prix. 2023, I mean, it was more of a stock boosting year for Alex Albon. He picked up 27 points on his own, effectively beating the tally of Alfa Tauri, Alfa Romeo and Haas. One flashpoint in that incredible year that made headlines at the time but fell into the background as the season progressed was the Canadian Grand Prix in Montreal. For Alex, fitting those slicks in Q2 when the field was split between the wet and the soft choice, getting that lap in before the rain came down, it had echoes of Kevin Magnussen's pole in Sao Paulo the year prior, though of course for Kevin that was in Q3 rather than just getting into the top 10 in Q2. But still for Alex, it was a show of confidence that foreshadowed his impressive performance in the race to come. He was, of course, as he was for most of the year, a mile ahead of his teammate and it was a successful showcase of the talent throughout his garage to nail that opportunity and sneak into the top 10. Eventually, it was a starting position of P9 for Alex Albon. He was perfectly executing the hard option one-stop strategy. He was able to brilliantly manage his tyre wear, making the hard tyres last for 58 laps. And fascinatingly, Alex did all of this without a functioning rear tyre temperature sensor, meaning that engineer feedbacks and intuition was his only assistance for managing those rear tyre temps. He was able to perfectly spin the plates of pace and degradation on his way to P4 and 6 
six really valuable World Championship points. The same amount of points that Daniel Ricciardo got for a similarly underrated performance at the Mexican Grand Prix later in the year. And the ex-Mercedes and Braun veteran, now Williams team principal, James Fowles, revealed that this problem was detected before the race and could not be fixed on the grid, meaning that Alex Albon was without data for the entirety of the 70-lap race. The first battle for Alex came when Magnussen's Haas and Piastri's McLaren were fighting it out, particularly heading into that final chicane, and eventually Alex Albon was able to come out on top in that scrap. By the final third of the race with those degraded tyres, it was George Russell who arrived on his gearbox. It was perfect battery harvesting and deployment, backing up into the slow corners, getting the late apexes for the fast exits. Classic Alex Albon defending, as George Russell's engineer called it. Russell later fell back and even found himself in the wall later on. He was replaced by a DRS train of Ocon, Stroll, Bottas and Piastri, who found themselves unable to make any further forward progress when they arrived behind Alex's FW45. And it was Vowles who post-race stressed this about Alex's performance. He said in a Sky interview after the race, the way I described it to him was really a drive of champions to make no mistake when you have a stack of cars behind you that are clearly much quicker with your tyres going away from you. It's an extraordinary drive and he did incredibly well with it. So the final entry underrated moment number five that I have in this list is Lando Norris's P4 at the Red Bull Ring. It was his first 10 out of 10 driver rating of the year on our site's driver rating report. Lando, he was a mainstay in the top of the timing sheets all weekend as that McLaren was prepped with new parts and upgrades that were perfectly tuned to a circuit that Lando had already shown format before. Of course, the Red Bull Ring was where Lando took his first podium back in 2020 season opener, and though it's unavoidable that the legacy of the 2023 Austrian Grand Prix will be purely based on track limits and Esteban Ocon memes, Lando Norris's run through those Austrian hills was the first sign of technical light for the MTC as their new rapidly produced upgrades delivered versatile and consistent pace that they could then carry forward to that second half of the year, carry forward to Silverstone to Belgium and as you well know to Qatar, Sao Paulo and all the other rounds that McLaren really proved that they were one of the best teams on the grid. In terms of what actually happened in the race in Austria, well, Lando dropped a P5 at the start, but he fought well at turn one to avoid dropping any further. He put a brilliant move on Hamilton to squeeze ahead of him to get into P4, but he was passed later on in the race by Carlos Sainz for that same position. Then P5 across the line was elevated into P4 after all those track limits penalties that I've already mentioned. Lando said after the race that it was a very good day. I was a little bit surprised that we had the race pace that we did. It was good to be fighting the Ferraris and the Red Bulls. And more importantly, we beat both the Astons and the Mercedes, which was our main goal today. Overall, a good day and good points. It's one of those tracks which is easy to get punished on. We kept it on track, didn't make any big mistakes with some good racing at times. The team has done a great job again. Thank you to everyone back in the factory for bringing that upgrade because that definitely got us in the points today. A big cheers to them. For Lando in 2023, then it was a championship personal best of 205 points, eight new additions to that trophy cabinet and a contract renewal that financially reflected his fantastic form. It had some well-deserved rewards for Lando who has been rewarded for that loyalty to the papaya, their team and their fans. So to avoid being completely reductionist, 2023 was far more than a single year of manufacturer dominance, though the unavoidable legacy of Verstappen will be etched into the history of the sport. Let me know in the comments what underrated moments you'll remember from the 2023 season and what you're hoping to see change next year. As always, thank you very much for watching. Check out Crash.net for coverage across the motorsport world and subscribe to this channel to stay up to date with all the F1 news as we head into the third year of the ground effect regulations.